Do you know that one of my first impressions, you know, apart from the scale, is, is actually they are beautiful in their own right. Individually, it's beautiful sculpture, isn't it? They look very fierce as well. I mean, it's a silly thing to say, but they do look particularly fierce, I think. The more you good. look at them, the more details there are. So it is true that each terracotta warrior is different. I think each one is slightly different, yes, but there are similarities, there are sets, um, but the details are done by hand, so they are slightly different. Here you can see a belt hook, and you can actually see how they were used, and it's even more interesting because when we have our exhibition, we're going to have some bronze belt hooks from that period. This man's got a centre parting and a little goatee beard. And then round the back, he's got a rather interesting a sort of French plait oh, type yeah. thing. Oh, um, detail, that's exquisite. And this, I guess, is a sort of hair slide in the middle to fix it together. And it's very intricately plaited. It's extraordinary. These ones have got side top knots and plaits. And you can see not only the details of the plaits, but the details of each individual hair. Why do you think there's all this sort of diversity with the hairstyles? Well, I think they show different ranks. For example, the officers have hats on. The infantry, a lot of them have these side top knots. So I think it's to do with rank and possibly to do with uh, the different areas of China that they come from as well. The faces in the Terracotta Army reflect the different ethnic groups brought here to work from across the empire. You can still see this diversity in the faces around the city. The Terracotta Army is big business for Xi'an. There's a booming trade in replica warriors. The Chinese invented mass production, and that's what's driving their buoyant economy today. It's so fun, you can actually touch these ones, can't you? <laughs> Is this, in miniature, a little bit like the process that was gone through 2,000 years ago to, to build the, uh, the real terracotta soldiers? It's a little bit like it. It's not entirely like it, because this is one small terracotta warrior being built in one whole mould, whereas, of course, the big ones were built in pieces. Some of the parts were in moulds, like the heads. You can tell they've got these lines around here where they've been joined together. And also the hands were made in moulds and then stuck onto the bodies. The legs were sometimes made with sort of slabs of clay rolled into a kind of pipe, like the drain pipes. It does give you a strong sense, you've got all the ladies here making it, it gives you a strong sense of the kind of production line. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Just as these replicas are individually finished by hand, so were the original terracotta warriors. The full-size figures take a week to be fired in a giant walk-in kiln. The people who built this vast army were part of a massive logistical operation, and this is what underpinned Qin Shi Huangdi's success. If you can manufacture and build on such a massive scale, you can mobilize and supply armies for long periods. That means you can defeat your enemies in war. Archaeologists have a good idea of how the Qin workers constructed the terracotta army. First, they dug a pit with access ramps and built walls of compressed earth to create corridors. Then they closed off the pit with a wooden roof. They then carried the warriors down the ramps into the corridors. Presumably they had some form of lighting, as of course it would have been dark. It must have taken skill to carry the heavy warriors, horses and chariots into the cramped spaces. Once the army was in place, the roof was covered in matting, the entrances were sealed, and earth piled on top. The underground army was not designed to be seen by human eyes, and it remained hidden for over 2,000 years. There's something many of us don't realize about the warriors. When they were entombed, they didn't look as they do now. Wow. 
Look, these are the warriors that have got pigment on them. This comes as a real surprise to me. Well, yes, they're not terracotta coloured at all. They were brightly painted. This is the result of some conservation work which has been done with the Germans. And they've come up with this technique of preserving the pigments. So you've got this sort of flesh coloured face. Yeah. And then uh, these wonderful red, the, the detail of the red, and holding the armoured plates together. And then this fantastic, what, what colour is that, that? This is purple. pan purple, it's called. It's electric. I mean, it's so bright, isn't it? It's extraordinary. It is incredible. It's very rare, this colour. But, I mean, to think that they had purple armour, it just seems incredible. Purple, yellow, pink, blue, red. Do we know if this is a sort of accurate depiction of the kind of colours they'd wear into battle? Well, the thing is that we don't have any evidence about what the armour looked like, what the clothes looked like, except for the warriors that have been excavated from the pit. So, actually, this is our evidence. Whether the colour was the colours that the clothes and armour would have been when they went into battle, or whether they were actually in ceremonial armour and dress, I don't know. Pit one, staggering enough, but imagine if they were all in their original colours. It would like have been this. incredible, wouldn't it? It would have been so right. They would have looked amazing. At the British Museum it's May and the reading room has been closed for two months. Nobody seems to be complaining about the temporary library and librarians can still access the books left in the reading room. This is the first time Carolyn and Stephen have seen the space since building work began. <gasps> it's huge! So here's the archer. Go down the stairs a bit and see when you start to see me. I can see you. Oh, that's there. a perfect sight line. Yeah. That is amazing. So you've got a fantastic view. On the bottom of the stairs, you get the archer. Yeah. How good is that? So we're in the second section, and what I really want to understand is the scale of the presentation of the warriors. So, and I'm pretty blown away. Right. Is that David, is, is David, David at the other end? David's at the lectern edge, the rail. <gasps> so from where we are here to where David is, is the footprint of where the warriors will be positioned. Yeah. <gasps> it's and they're wonderful. And they're on this floor that's a, the putty colour yes. of the terracotta as yes. well. And you can persuade your client and you can say, I know it's going to be good, and the models and all the drawings you do, but nothing is like standing there. It is going to look extraordinary. The long imagined design is emerging from the drawing board. The fabric wall is a screen for projected images of the terracotta army to give a sense of scale. So yeah. you've got the army here yeah. and you've got these changing shows. On the cyclorama. On the cyclorama yeah. on either side. Yeah. As a sort of grand theatrical backdrop. It's going to be spectacular. <laughs> A great green ring hides the lighting cables and helps reduce the echo in the room while allowing visitors to see the beautiful 19th century dome, which is actually made of papier-mâché. So the room is still a star. It is, isn't it? It's still expressed and, and, within the exhibition. And people won't know, they won't realise, they won't really understand that they've been lifted up into the dome. Yeah. And it will have that more tomb-like feel in yeah, a way. Which I hope is, so. yeah. Which is... Yeah. <laughs> Qin Shawandi had started building his tomb during his 25-year reign as King of Qin, and building was expanded during his 11 years as Emperor. It was an amazing feat of organisation with forced labour from all over the empire. He conscripted 700,000 workers. That's twice the population of Cardiff. The whole area was made its own government district with officials to oversee the building and then maintenance of the big tomb complex. You can imagine the scene here. It would have been seething with people and factories, kilns, armories and potteries. Everyone working towards one goal, which was one of the most ambitious construction projects of the ancient world. No one's sure how extensive the tomb complex is, but there are frequent new discoveries. These blue sheds enclosed pits that were unearthed in 1997. 
One contains some grisly remains. Well, you don't have to be a pathologist to know what these bones are here. Pretty evocative remains of some of those who must have died building this massive complex. Some of the army of several hundred thousand conscripts. I talked to Duan Ching Bo, who has one of the best jobs in world archaeology. He's in charge of excavating the first emperor's necropolis. It's a long-term project requiring compulsory purchase of the land. We're migrating all the villages and factories in a two-square-kilometer area around the Tomb Mound. First, we'll focus on that area, and then gradually work out to an area of 60 square kilometers. They've already made some stunning discoveries. The tomb mound sits at the heart of an underground palace surrounded by rectangular stone walls. The outermost is two and a half kilometers long. Northeast of the tomb mound, beside a large lake, is an F-shaped pit which contains life-size bronze water birds, cranes, swans and geese. Nearby, there were terracotta musicians in wooden compartments. Within the palace walls is a pit which contained two magnificent half-scale bronze chariots. One has a completely enclosed carriage, which may illustrate how the first emperor traveled on his tours around the empire. Another pit contained entertainers, an acrobat who might once have spun a ball, a strong man whose arm once gripped a pole, and a huge bronze vessel, perhaps for weightlifting. And to make sure everything ran smoothly, there were civil servants. Paper hadn't been invented, but these men wrote on bamboo strips. They made corrections with a knife worn on the belt, sharpened with a whetstone. No one knows what treasures await the archaeologists when the local residents have gone and the whole area can be excavated. But work continues where possible. A huge collection of armour has been discovered very close to the tomb mound. It's actually quite deep, isn't it? What is it? Six, eight, ten metres? Duan Ching Bo estimates that this trench represents just one percent of the entire armoury. This is the armour made of stone. It's an incredibly intricate process. They're, they're labelling every single... Certain parts are still quite intact there. There's a, a couple of pieces there. I mean, is this armor for the torso up here? This is for the shoulder. Once lifted, it's taken next door to be painstakingly reconstructed. Each suit weighs around 18 kilograms with up to 800 limestone pieces held together with copper wire. What was stone armor? Because you couldn't wear it, it was too heavy. So what, what was it doing down here? It was probably for use in the spirit world. You in the West believe that after dying, the spirit goes to heaven. And in China, we believe the same thing. Who was wearing this armor? Is this spare armor in case the terracotta army needs some more? This is not for the terracotta warriors, no. In the other world, the emperor would have a spirit army. The main difference is that the terracotta warriors don't have helmets. Here they have helmets. So it shows that on the battlefield, the Qin army did have helmets. Why, what sort of way of thinking he had when he decided to have stone armor, he really doesn't know. We couldn't find reasons for many things. For example, we don't know why he made the warriors so big or why he made bronze horses and chariots. But for all we don't know, Duan Qingbo is probably closer to the first emperor than anyone. I believe I'm the person who understands Chen Shi Wangdi best. It doesn't matter how much treasure there is. The most important thing is that he put into his tomb his new system of government. It's a grand vision, 
not just a collection of beautiful artifacts for the afterlife, but a representation of the first emperor's whole society.